Thanks, everybody. Welcome back. to the, This uh, next session is a careers in aviation panel. And I've already introduced myself a couple times. So I'm Professor Bill Crossley, and I'm the head here in aeronautics and astronautics. And I'm going to introduce our panel really quick. Uh, we've sent them a couple questions in advance. I'll try to ask a couple interesting questions. And I am, I was actually thinking, I would just say, well, the panelists this morning asked, and the panelists this morning asked, because she did such a great job. So <laughs> hopefully you will be patient with me on my questions. I, I'm not nearly that savvy uh, on this. So we tried to sit in order so that the, the, the PowerPoint above us is like our virtual name tags, in case you do have a question for one of us specifically. So sitting right immediately next to me is Captain Margie Freeman. She's a pilot for United Airlines. She flies the Boeing 767, and she's based up at O'Hare in Chicago. She's flown for 30 years. She's got ratings in the 727, which doesn't fly anymore, mm -hmm. 737, 757, and 767, and flies both internationally and domestically. She graduated from the University of Illinois in their professional pilot program in 1984. And you'll notice we have a couple of members of the panel who are members of the 99s. So she's a member of the Experimental Aviation Association, Women in Aviation, and the 99s, all organizations that recognize and celebrate women in aviation. She's got her own Cessna 172 and a 340. So, I flew it here this morning. So she flew here this So you fly for your job, and then you fly for, uh, for yeah. and then you sleep. Sometimes. Sometimes, okay. <laughs> Very good. Well, welcome. Thank you. Uh, sitting next to, to it, I guess it's two over. I was going to say to my left, but that's your right, and then I got confused, and so I apologize. <laughs> sitting next to Margie is Katherine Johnson. She's a project engineer with the Boeing Company. She's the project engineer and team lead for the Hornet Health Assessment and Readiness Tool, like which all good things has an acronym. It's HART. I guess the second H is silent. It's H-H-A-R-T. <laughs> Some people can put a I don't know that I can. It's like when I try to speak Dutch when I visit the Netherlands. I can't, yes. So if you're Dutch, you could help me pronounce it. But anyway, she's supporting the Boeing Defense Systems F-18 uh, program. And now i got to put my glasses back where I can read them. So she does that. It enhances uh, aircraft system health by utilizing data and engineering knowledge to provide timely, enhanced troubleshooting guidance that will improve aircraft readiness and aircraft safety. So this is one of the things that ties to another initiative here at Purdue, our data science. So how does data science fit engineering? We might have some questions for Catherine about that. She was on the F-22 reliability and maintainability team before that, and she's had a couple of different assignments, almost all at Boeing, it looks like, and all in Boeing Defense. And she earned her degree in aero and astro from here at Purdue University. Then next, <laughs> boiler up, right? <laughs> then next to her is Jen Watson Perez. So Jen is the global technical capability development leader at GE Aviation. She's responsible for the technical growth and development of the nearly 8,000 engineers around the globe who work for GE Aviation. So that's a pretty big responsibility, pretty big reach for Jen. This includes something that, when you, if you get a chance later, you can talk to her about the Edison Engineering Development Program. That's an outstanding opportunity if you want to work for a, a gas turbine engine company or anywhere at GE, but it just the gens at the gas turbine part of the aviation. It's an outstanding opportunity for young, technical, excellent leader development. Um, she started at GE as a co-op while attending here at Purdue, and then she spent time in the engineering, uh, sorry, Edison Engineering Development Program creating aerothermal cycle models of gas turbine engines. So she might have done well on Professor Heaster's test, right? I don't know if Beth did so well, but uh, she's been the performance of the transient, uh, sorry, became the manager of the transient performance team. So she was creating and validating state-of-the-art cycle models for gas turbine engines. And that, that role got her excited about training and, and helping develop other engineering leaders. She graduated from Purdue with a bachelor's degree in aero and astro. She was a member of Phi Sigma Rho, co-captain of the National Championship Rube Goldberg team, and many of you here are familiar with our space day. She was one of our directors for Purdue Space Day. So welcome, Jen. <laughs> then to Jen's left is Margaret Wint. Margaret works at Benz Aviation, where she's been an assistant manager of a small airport in Michigan for 10 years, so another important part of the aerospace business. Right? We always joke that uh, takeoff is optional, landing is mandatory, <laughs> and we'd like to land at the airport. That's a preferred option. right? Uh, she's been a test proctor for FAA knowledge tests. She's an instrument rated private pilot, single engine land, and has flown more than 885 hours. And she's been an active member of the 99s for 14 years, has held offices at the chapter and North Central section staff. Air racing is one of her passions, and she's competed in several, including the Air Race Classic, which some of our students have competed in. And then, if you were here earlier this morning, you already heard um, the Honorable Sue Payton's bio, but I want to flip and make sure in case you hadn't. So Sue Payton, and she's listed this way, and it's true if you get the chance to talk with her, you see all these things are true very quickly. Change agent, 
acquisition expert, innovative industry leader, and public servant. And she's worked for over 37 years, continued success in senior industry and government positions with the military services, defense agencies, coalition partners, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Officer, Office of the Secretary of Defense, the intelligent com intelligence community, Congress, universities like Purdue, and the media. She's the former Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition and former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense and currently is the President at SCI Aerospace. So thanks for joining us on the panel, Sue. Appreciate it. So what we did this morning is right away the panelists started asking a couple of questions. I wanted to ha ask something and I, I thought this was interesting. A few years ago, the AIAA, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, one of our big professional societies, ran a campaign that was called When Do You Know? And the idea behind that was to celebrate careers in aerospace. And so I thought I would start our panel. We sent them a bunch of questions and things. This one wasn't on it, but I think this one's really relevant. Perfect. When did you know? When did you know you, you were going to do what you're doing today? I'll just go, well, I was going to say left to right, and I guess that works as my left, so we'll start with you. I knew from a very early age, a young girl, this is what I wanted to do. But at the time, you didn't tell anybody because you risked being dismissed. But it turned out and persevered, so I knew at a very young age, grade school. What about you, Catherine? I would echo that. Um, I think I was about five. And I knew I wanted to, I wanted to be an astronaut. So oh, that was... No, I was going to be the astronaut. There it is. See? Yeah. Great. If you talk to Beth, you can all be astronauts. Exactly, right? <laughs> it can happen. Um, yeah, I, w I wanted to be an astronaut. I found out when we had returned back from a family vacation to Disney World. I could have cared less about Mickey. I loved Kennedy Space Center. At five years old, my dad was not thrilled. Um, but early age, I always loved rocket space travel, but it kind of evolved into a love just for flight in general. And that's kind of where I... I kept pursuing that path. Outstanding. Jen? Uh, for me, I was always interested in planes, and my dad was an engineer, so I figured I would go into engineering. But then it must have been the summer after my sophomore year in high school. I went to high school locally here, and I spent a week out at the airport doing a camp, essentially, where we built a balsa wood airplane and put it in the wind tunnel and cranked it up to see the wings break off. And I remember that when my dad picked me up at the end of the day, you know, I was there all day, I would just, you know, be overflowing with excitement about how much fun I had. And it was like, is this what it's like when you go to work? And he was like, if you're lucky, you know? And so <laughs> at that point I knew, okay, I'm gonna do aero. Um, it's, it's, it was just so cool for me. Excellent. Let's keep going down the line, Margaret. Mine was a little bit later. Um, I kind of had a life-changing event in my life and said, you know, I think I'll do what I want to do now instead of what everybody else expects me to do. So I didn't, start, I didn't even start flying until I was in my 40s. And now I race and do most anything aviation-related. <laughs> Outstanding. Sue, what about you? You came a little bit this morning, but... Uh, no, I'm a total misfit to <laughs> knowing anything about where I was going to be in 40 years. Started out as a uh, teacher, loved coaching. All I ever wanted to do was teach and coach. And then this guy I married ripped me out of my teaching position and <laughs> moved me to California. And again, I was sitting on the couch and Ronnie Reagan said, if you're unemployed, um, go get into uh, data processing. Learn about computers. And uh, so I would say that starting in the 82 time frame was when I totally did a complete career change. And I realized, um, even though as a young student at your age and in high school even, I was told I could be a secretary, a nurse, or a teacher. So I couldn't type, and I hated the sight of blood, so <laughs> I ended up in teaching, and just, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, and that's how... I sort of ended up on a totally different career path. Uh, that's, that's great, Sue. They're just all different stories. I, I, I want to just put my little spin in here just a little bit. So when I was about four or five, I think, you know, I took my dad to the Greater Cincinnati Airport to go on a business trip and I marveled at the airplane that he took off in. But the job I have now, head of the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Purdue University, what an awesome job. But I never thought that I would be in this job. 
So what are some of the things that happened to you from the when you knew, I knew I wanted to be an aerospace engineer when I was five or six. I'm an aerospace engineer, but I didn't know I was going to be doing this. So when did you know you were going to be flying airplanes or running a major program at Boeing or overseeing the development of thousands of engineers? Margie? So, so the question is, when did I know, or? No, I'm, I'm thinking about what happened along the way. I'm trying to, trying to draw this out. I'll just be more explicit. So for students who are listening and thinking about, okay, well, how, what does my career path look like? Some of us picked A, and we were A the whole time. I picked A, and I did B, and I did C, and I did 7, and then I did X, and eventually <laughs> I ended up, <laughs> and I'm kind of curious about that path, so we, we can give some examples. Well, I think... I, I, as a child of the 60s, I think I wanted to be an astronaut. You know, I wasn't, I was only half kidding. Um, but pursued more of the aviation as, uh, you know, just as a kid going to the airport and watching family members fly and take off on these beautiful machines. Um, there was really, there were two options. There was the military or the civilian route. Uh, the military didn't have many options available uh, for women when I was 18 and having to choose. Um, so education, civilian route, there was, it was, that was the path. So there weren't many option routes to go for me, but. And so piloting was the one and you've been a pilot. Oh yeah, I mean, once I started flying at, at a college airport, I mean, just automatically fell in love with it. And that's what we and heard, you fly and you don't even sleep anymore. So no, I don't sleep. Great. <laughs> it's outstanding. Well, uh, as wanting to be an astronaut when I was a kid, I know, sorry, I'm glad I sat by you though. Um, ignore, the, ignore the order that, that's happening up there. Um, wanting to be an astronaut, well, you kind of, I, I was definitely on that path. You could, not, you could not change my dream that I wanted to have. So then you get older and you're like, okay, well, how do you make this dream a reality? And it was very, it was, to me, it was military or the civilian route. And, um, on another family vacation. Uh, my dad was really good at family vacations, right, with these dreams. Um, we went to the United States Naval Academy, and I said, this is it. This is where I want to go. Spoiler alert, I went to Purdue, but uh, I'll get there. Um, went, went to the United States Naval Academy, fell in love with it. I had that call to service, um, and I wanted to be a fighter pilot. So that was when I was probably about 10 years old, got to high school age, said, okay, how do we make that dream possible? So I started applying to the academies to be a pilot, to be an engineer. And unfortunately, I am blind as a bat. And they're like, no, you, you're not going to, it's bad. Um, you don't want to trust me with, trust me on the data with the, with the million dollar jet, not to fly it though. So uh, unfortunately, it was not in my cards to be a fighter pilot, and so I kind of had to accept that. That was a big challenge to overcome. That had been my dream for the longest, as long as I could remember. And so luckily, my recruiter that I had been working with said, let's look at civilian colleges. Let's look at Purdue University. So I said, okay, let's look at it. I came here for a visit. Obviously, Neil Armstrong came here, so by golly, I want to come here. And uh, that's kind of... I. I Back when I was a kid, wanting to be an astronaut, was definitely set on doing that, and I never, never would have maybe pictured that I would have gone to into Boeing. I always thought I would be career military um, routed, um, but I always did have that call to service still, and I have had the lucky opportunity to work on defense programs within Boeing. So in a way, I'm still able to serve just in other facets, and it's kind of come full circle now in a different way. Awesome, very good, Jen. What about you? Yeah. Uh, for me, I've definitely had people influence kind of the twists and turns through my careers. Um, when I was a freshman, I knew I wanted to do the co-op program here at Purdue. I knew some people older than me who said, oh, if you co-op at Delta, you can fly standby for free and travel the world. So I was like, hey, that sounds awesome. Uh, so I sat down with Professor Williams and I said, I want to apply at Delta. And he, he told me, if you're going to apply at Delta, you should apply at GE. And I must have had a look on, his, on my face like, what are you talking about? Um, I did not know GE made aircraft engines at the time. And so he filled me in that a lot of what you would do in a Delta, Delta co-op rotation would be similar to what you might do um, at a GE co-op. So he was the one who introduced me to GE, um, and it was completely off my radar. Then when I got to GE, uh, they put me in a performance group. I remember looking at a cross-section and not knowing where there was metal and where there was air. Um, 
But then, you know, so this was the summer after my freshman year. Then when I came back to school and I took ME 200, and it was like, oh, this is the stuff I was working on at work. And this is so cool to now get the theory piece of it behind what my poor manager probably assumed I already had under my belt. Um, so, you know, for me, that was one turning point. Another point, you know, now I'm in this more technical learning space. And that also kind of happened just by talking with a colleague and a mentor. I had been itching for a new job, and I reached out to a friend, and she started selling this role to me and saying, hey, I have, a, I have an opening. I'm looking for someone who can contemporize our technical education, and I think you'd be great at it. And I was like, no, nah, I'm an engineer. Like, I, no, that sounds like HR work. Um, but after we started talking about it, it really is just a big engineering problem, right? I'm just dealing with people and their skills or knowledge versus an aircraft engine and its jet fuel, right? Um, so again, it was another case where maybe my career has taken a turn, but it was really influenced by a mentor or someone kind of pushing me in a direction that maybe I wasn't really thinking about. What about you, Margaret? Um, just like Sue, you know, when I graduated from high school, you became a teacher or a nurse or whatever. I knew that was, I was never going to work in a classroom. <laughs> <laughs> so I did retail and, and everything. And my husband is an engineer, so I'm used to being around engineering. He is a chemical engineer, sorry. <laughs> but um, so, you know, I went one way. And after 10 years in retail, you really want to kill everybody. <laughs> Workers, customers, you don't care. Um, and so then I went into wholesale, and I worked in wholesale until they called us all in on a Friday morning and said, guess what? We have no room for you anymore. And let like 25 of us go in one. Now I was already taking flying lessons, so the guy at the airport was very nice. He said, would you like to work here? And I'll trade you working in the office for airplane time to get your instrument rating. So that's how I started, and I've just kind of stayed. <laughs> that's great. And persistence there, right? That, <laughs> hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this. I guess resilience is probably the better word. I'm going to get through this. We're gonna well, yeah, but then he ended up selling that plane, and I bought my own, so I finished all my instrument rating in my own plane. <laughs> Sue, what about you? Well, I go back to sitting on the couch, right? And uh, well, how did you go from couch to Pentagon, right? Yeah, that wasn't a pl I, I, that wasn't a plan, you. right? I don't think anybody plans that. It Maybe somebody a, does, but it, it was Mr. Toad's wild ride. It was uh, education, education. Um, I got a job with Harris Corporation as an administrative assistant, and that meant I I would go for donuts. I would get the conference room ready, but I wouldn't be allowed in there for the meetings. And I wouldn't be allowed in there to help with the architecture or to understand the interface requirements. And it just rubbed me the wrong way. So I jumped in a master's degree program at USC, uh, studied pretty hard because I had to get a pretty high score on the GRE and I had to get A's on the first four classes. Ended up getting that uh, master's degree in uh, actually systems technology and system acquisition. And um, woke up one morning after three years, and I was still in the same cubicle, right? My, my bosses, and they did not recognize that I was a different person than they had hired. And my husband said to me one day, well, the only way you're going to get out of the cubicle is to either leave the company and go, get it, go with a different company now that you have a master's degree and you have three years of experience exactly in what this company needed. And they were hiring people. They were hiring people in above me, right, who didn't have my knowledge or uh, a master's degree. So I created my resume without my name on it. I took it into my boss who was giving away free dinners to people who, who would bring in new, new folks. And I said, you know, sir, I've got the perfect person. This person has the security clearances, understands the program, understands the architecture, knows the customer, has immense uh, you know, ability to really contribute. And he said, when can I talk to him? When can I bring him in? I, I want to talk to him immediately. Because we were getting dinged every three months on our fee because we weren't hiring up. And I said, well, sir, that's me. 
oh, I didn't know, <laughs> right? And I said, and this resume is going on the street in a month, and I wanted to tell you that because it's the high integrity thing to do. Tell your boss when you're going to go interview with other people. And he said, would you give me a month to see if I can get you a promotion and get you a pay raise and move you in? I said, yes, sir, I'd love to stay with this program and this customer and the, and the technology. And so six weeks later, um, I got the promotion. And I, you know, but sometimes you, you have to trick the system because you get put in a box and people think of you as they thought of you three years ago. And you have changed so much in those three years. So I thank my husband for giving me the brainiac idea to go do that. And it was an inflection point uh, that helped open so many other doors to get that credential, to get those promotions. That's great. So there are three big th themes that I took from the organizers here to talk about, you know, career questions, diversity in aviation, and looking forward. That was kind of the themes they asked me to kind of help about. And before we start the questions that, they, that you've seen and that they kind of asked me to, to give you, I was thinking about this a little bit. I'm wondering if each of you might have some thoughts about those topics, and in particular, if there's something that you think is really important in those that you think about that you're not sure that other people really think about. Is there something about career questions or career advancement that you really worry about that you're not sure everybody else is paying attention to or about the diversity in aviation or about even looking forward at the future of aviation. We can go in any of those directions and then I'll start asking some of their questions, but hopefully this will get the audience thinking a little bit about, wait a minute, I just heard her say this. I want to know more about that. So that's why I wanted this, something you might be thinking about that others aren't thinking about. We keep going the same order. Is that okay with all of you? <laughs> I can start doing, I can start randomized. Margie's always like, oh no, I have to go first. And every, everybody, I, oh then go, then, then by all means go first. Yes. <laughs> this one I can start with. You're, you're cleared for takeoff then, Captain, go. <laughs> so something that I think about, uh, and, and, and maybe it's just me, but you know, 30 years ago when I started my, my career, there was 3% female pilots in the commercial industry. And if you compared it to female doctors or female lawyers, the numbers were pretty low in all of those three fields. Now fast forward 30 years, and you look at the percentages in, in those three fields, and you, we, depending on what you read online, you know, lawyers, about half, maybe slightly less than half of lawyers are female now. And if you look at doctors, not surgeons so much, but doctors, general practitioners, not quite half, but almost half are females now. You look at airline pilots, we're still three to 5%. So there's something there. And I think that needs to be investigated or at least addressed. And there's all kinds of theories on why that is, but it's glaring. And so it is an issue and it is a problem. So that's something that I think about as I have a 20-year-old uh, a daughter who's interested in being an airline pilot like her mom and a 17-year-old son that's interested in being an airline pilot. So those type of things I think about. You ready, Catherine? We can skip around if you want. I just felt I bad that I kept ready. asking the captain all the questions first, and she didn't have any time to think about it. <laughs> no, I can be ready. I think um, concerning the themes, career, and the diversity, and also looking forward, a lot of it can be tied to change and accepting change and normalizing change. So actually, to Ms. Peyton's point, she had said, she, you handed off the resume, right, without a name. I can't wait to meet him, right? I am very guilty of this. Actually, Jen and I talked about this. On the defense side, I work, I engage regularly with pilots, Navy pilots, and it's very quick for me to say, well, how, how did he land the jet? How did he fly the jet? It's, it's just kind of the norm almost. And so it's, it's just kind of that awareness that a change should happen just in our normal jargon. And that if, a engineering, if an engineer is hired new to your team, oh, when does he start? 
It's just kind of a, it's a social thing that needs to be addressed, just like you were saying. Um, and it's nothing, there's no Ill, Ill will meant by that. It's just kind of society, how it's evolved over time. But it's, it's identifying that change, being aware of it, but also moving at the speed of change as well. Um, I was actually speaking about this earlier to a couple folks. Some of, some of what holds us back are regulations are put in place for everyone's safety, right? Uh, a lot of what I do is to improve system safety performance um, based off of data. However, there's, in order to do that effectively, it, it does take a long time. And the speed of innovation sometimes is such a hurdle and a challenge to get over. We have all these great and vibrant ideas, but it's really hard to execute them when you gotta get the contracts figured out or it's money driven, especially on the, on the defense side or the industry side. And so it's just all around change in career and diversity that it's accepting of that change, recognizing it and really just embracing the changes of the future, whatever they may be. Yeah, so I'll build on these themes, right? Um, <clears throat> when we talk about diversity and inclusion, the way I like to think about it is inclusion is about our environment, and if we focus more on having an inclusive environment for everyone, no matter what kind of bucket they fall into, um, then the diversity, which is more measurable, will kind of happen, right? So. Um, I think about the question earlier, we had a young man ask how can they be an ally? And I try to think about that myself. So I'm a woman, obviously, um, but I'm also white, I'm cisgendered, I'm heterosexual, I'm able-bodied, right? So there are people out there who I can be an ally for. Yes, I need men to be an ally for women. I need men to speak up when they hear another man make an inappropriate comment and say that's not okay, um, but I, can also be that ally to other groups and use they instead of he, for example. Um, you know, different things about around the language that I use on a daily basis to be to be that ally that I look, you know, for men to be an ally to me. I'm just trying to. <laughs> I still have the problem because I do work at a small airport and people walk in the door and they go, "Are you a pilot?" Really? I mean, even in this day and age, it is generally not this generation. You, you all have kind of accepted the fact that men and women can do the same thing. Um, but it is, uh, lots of times I do get that. And then they all freak out because I, you know, own a plane and I know how to, you know, I'm doing gliders and things like that. You want to be in a small minority? Be a woman glider pilot. <laughs> <laughs> They're really small. But um, so, yeah, we need the allies, whether it's another woman or it's a, it's a guy or whatever. Um, it's just, you know, we're, unfortunately, Sue and I are kind of in this generation of, uh, yeah, girls did this and guys did that. And, and I told my husband the other night, he, and he still didn't believe this because we went to high school together, I said, we were not allowed to take shop. I said, I was one of the first girls to take drafting. And that was a hard thing, and, uh, and architectural drawing. They just wouldn't let us in the shop. And I still have no idea why, because I'd rather work on an engine than be in the kitchen. <laughs> so. so inclusion, diversity and inclusion. I will, I will tell you that <clears throat> advising some of the companies that my husband and I do advise there are some of them who literally have five different generations in their workforce, as I'm sure you have recognized. And the, the gaps between the generations um, need some, some focus. We need to understand better how to get the very best out of the tra traditionalists that might still be there, because they were born up until 1945, and the baby boomers aren't going anywhere, okay? They want to work until they die. Uh, and, and so everybody wants them to just go home and let me have that job, right? But the baby boomers are going to be, uh, be around for quite a while. And then you have the Gen Xers, and they've been defined as sometime being born between 1965 and 1977. 
and they're a little bit more skeptical than the optimistic baby boomers, but um, not quite as tech savvy as your millennials. And uh, you've got your globals that I talked about earlier who are just inclusive and gender neutral. They don't care, they don't care what gender you are. So I highly recommend to you um, a lady named Anna Liotta uh, to, and read her book. She has an amazing, uh, not only analysis of how all these generations, if you can get the best out of all of them, it will be a huge force multiplier and enabler for your company growth. What ticks off the different generations and what makes them tick? And she gives tools in her book, and by the way, I don't get any money for publicizing this, but she's an, in, she's an incredible speaker. She has a 90-minute presentation that will really help you understand uh, that crazy baby boomer over there and why they think and do the things they do and help that baby boomer understand uh, what that millennial really just said. And I think that companies, and whether you're in the workforce as one of these uh, different generations or whether you're trying to lead, um, it's very important to understand how to get the best out of all the different folks in different generations. So I think that explains why Professor Spencer said he was mildly disapproving, because he and I must fit in Gen X. Just, bar go. just barely, but there we fit go. in Gen X, so. Let me ask a couple other questions, and I will turn it over to let people in the audience ask. Um, one of the things that we had on here was looking forward in aviation, so maybe we can like, put, our, put our thinking cap on and get the crystal ball out and see where a couple things might be going. One of the things I wrote down here, because I think all of us have some thoughts about this probably, advances in aviation still happen at a pretty fast pace. I mean, the airplane you fly on the outside probably looks a lot like the airplane you first started flying at United, but they're all different on the inside now. The engines are different. One of the promising developments is, is to use automation to make flying safer and maybe even eventually autonomy. And maybe that makes flying something that's ubiquitous. We could all go get in our flying vehicle and travel around. So that's something interesting to me. What do you think are some of these interesting technology developments that you see in your job in the aviation industry? So I was using that auto automation and autonomy as something I see as interesting. What do you see as interesting in the industry? I can, we, can, we don't have to make you go first unless you're ready. <laughs> um, so y you bring up a good point, but I would just make a comment that, you know, the airplane I fly for my company is, 35 years old, mm -hmm. and the technology that's in it, in, in, in many aspects, is the same technology from 35 years ago. That little airplane I have parked out at your airport here, all the bells and whistles, very sophisticated. It's getting that latest and greatest, um, and, and maybe that's not the goal, but um, the efficiencies that come with that technology are, are what the airlines are looking for, but it's hard to make that a cost-effective change um, in sort of the older generation airplanes um, on a wide-scale basis. Um, I, I think this is kind of funny, but maybe it's not. Um, we're, we're recently uh, integrating um, CPDLC as a mode of communication across areas where we were still using high frequency radio across the North Atlantic and the Pacific. And that's like text messaging for us. Um, that's just become available. And it's not even widespread yet or integrated worldwide. So some of the issues that um, we're faced with is there's the globalization of flying airplanes, um, working with different um, regulatory agencies, working with different countries, different rules of engagement as you go around the world. Um, so the technology is great. Bring it. I love it. We love it as pilots. I mean, that's we're just wired that way to, to embrace it. Sometimes it's slower for us older pilots, but we still love it. But to see it go wide scale takes a while to get it into my industry. It's a big capital investment, huge capital investment in our industry. Yep. It's, a, it's a big effort. So I, I, I'd like to hear more about the digital twins and health monitoring. You don't have to say that, but that's, 
I'm curious about that too. I mean, is there some other technology development that you're looking at that this is really neat to you and affects you in your job? Uh, so, in my in my role, it is it's it's data analytics. It's a very broad thing. We and that I would say goes from all the way of full data utilization. Um, in, I'm relatively new to my role in the data analytics world because everything that I've done data data wise in my career has been like analyze the data, test results, whatever it is, from a flight possibly, um, through debrief process, and then you go and troubleshoot. That's kind of been what it is. It's very reactive to a problem that's already been in existence. Now we have other programs and platforms that are going to you know, change how a system might perform in the future, upgrades, retrofits, whatever, whatever have you. But we're kind of moving now into the predictive analytics realm, machine learning, AI. It's all very exciting, but it takes so much time. And what, what is really important, it's not about just you know taking a bunch of data and throwing it into a supercomputer. It's not that simple. In order to make it effective and, and, and be able to be executed, you have to have engineering expertise. You have to have that subject matter expert um, able to, th to, to put a different flavor, put their different glasses on, so to speak. I said there's, you can have all the data in the world, but it depends on what glasses you wear, you see different kinds of data, right? You see different results. And so it's kind of interesting, I think, the way of the future is, is I like to call a digital thread, um, seeing how data can make, can lead to data-driven decisions, but also have proactive versus that reactive maintenance concept. And this is, this is really on the defense side, maintenance initiatives to ultimately improve readiness, which you had mentioned earlier. Um, to prove aircraft system performance as well, and ultimately improve safety. I mean, you're having these pilots go up and fly these heavily integrated machines. And we talked about autonomy. If, if you're still having someone behind flying the jet, there's there's only so much autonomy you can you can have, right? There needs to be that human interaction there, um, especially depending on the aircraft or just as yourself. If you're flying many many people. That that that's it needs to be in human hands in some way. I mean, that might be a personal thing on my on my uh, soapbox, if you will. But data analytics, I think, it, a lot of data can drive data decisions, but it can shed light on new opportunities as you kind of pull on that digital thread in many ways. Not sure if that answered your no, question. I, well, I, I, <laughs> yeah. There is no right answer. I'm just curious yeah. what you were thinking about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll agree. I mean, all the stuff with data, anal data analytics is fascinating. A couple other things that come to mind for me, it was mentioned this morning, additive manufacturing and 3D printing. That's a game changer, right? We can, we can print parts now that have intricate inner surfaces that you could not physically make in the past. You know, And it, what it's doing is, is challenging our engineers to think differently about how to design a part. So you know, if you let go of what you know about uh, traditional manufacturing, and you just think about the purpose of a part, does it actually look the way you think it looks, right? And so 3D printing and additive manufacturing is really revolutionizing um, all of that as far as a design and a manufacturing supply chain perspective. Uh, the other thing, too, that I find interesting for personal reasons is the idea of supersonic flight coming back for commercial. Um, I have a sister-in-law who lives in London. My husband and I enjoy traveling. I would love to be able to get somewhere quicker. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, specifically at GE, one project that we're working on, we have an engine called, called the Affinity Engine. We're working with Arion, who's partnered with Boeing, to design a, business, a supersonic business jet that will fly subsonic over land and then Mach 1.4. Um, and the interesting thing there is that there are some challenges. Right now there's a regulation that says no sonic booms over land. But there hasn't been a whole lot of research into why that is. And so um, NASA actually is doing some research to say, what if we could have a low boom that's equivalent, you know, on an audible range to a semi on a highway? If, if we could get a sonic boom down to that level, then would that regulation go away? And then does that kind of open some doors? Because I think one thing I remember learning at Purdue specifically was if you design an airplane to do multiple things, it's probably going to be average at those multiple things, right? If you design an airplane to do one specific mission, it's going to be good at that mission. So to, to design a supersonic business jet that's good at Mach 1.4 and good subsonic, that's a big challenge. Margie, I understand because we're retrofitting our plane with 
some new parts and pieces and things like that. And I know how much it costs for a little single engine. I can't imagine how much it would cost the airlines. Um, but the other thing is you have to think about what happens when, sorry, it fails. <laughs> and all of a sudden you have a pilot who doesn't remember how to fly the plane. And that, and that does happen sometimes. You know, it's like, I mean, even though we, we practice it, when you get in the jets, unless you're doing it in a simulator, you really don't practice it. Um, but so that's one of the things that we kind of have to think about is, yeah, I'm, I've been in a brand new 172 that had 80 hours on it and was entirely glass. And I looked at her and I said, I have no idea how to, how to even make this work. You know, um, I have a 50-year-old plane and we've just upgraded everything. So it will be as close to glass as we can make it. So there are several reasons why we don't upgrade our aircraft, especially in the Department of Defense, as rapidly as we need to. And that's because we pretty much have vendor lock uh, in our cargo planes and in our fighter planes and our bombers. And uh, when I first got in the Pentagon, we were looking at an open architecture from the Rapid Capabilities Office, and we brought in the big OEMs that really were the folks who were building our weapon systems, our fighters and our cargo planes. And we said, we want an open architecture so that we can plug in a different avionics package. We want the interface published so that we can switch out things and upgrade more easily. And it's gonna be very interesting to see what really happens with our new B-21 because it was really the first uh, plane that was bid to a standard open architecture that should allow us to avoid vendor lock and be able to get the best price performance point for those components as we upgrade that system over decades and decades. So um, I would say that the more we focus on requirements that drive open architectures into everything we do, the quicker we'll be able to enhance them, upgrade them, and we won't have uh, a bomber that uh, came off the production line in the Eisenhower era that um, really doesn't have the, the latest that it could have in, uh, in avionics. I have a great deal of hope for open architectures in our, in our defense systems in the future. And I'm sure the airline industry would love it if you accomplish that. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we're we working with the commercial side of the world to get that. But let's face it, the biggest profit in the life cycle is in O&M and in contracted logistics support and in owning that tech baseline with that proprietary stuff for 40 years. And you can name your own price because you're the only game in town. And so until the government incentivizes for openness, we won't get it. Not only do we have to incentivize it, we have to grade the homework and make sure that what's being built remains op open so we can plug and play. Yeah. Lots of interesting insight there. That's across the map. Let me ask a question here. It's a little tweak on one of the questions we sent you. So take yourself now and talk to your 22-year-old self. That's probably the average age of the students here. What's the one piece of advice you would tell 22-year-old Sue or Margaret or Jen or Catherine? Or what, what was that piece of advice that you would tell 22-year-old yourself? Can I start with you, Sue? Because I keep always putting you <laughs> bet. Margie on first. <laughs> there are actually two things. The minute you hit the ground running in your first position, Take a few weeks and figure out who the real leaders, bright rock star people are in that organization. And I don't care what level. And seek a mentor. I will tell you, any time I've ever asked for a mentor, I was never rejected. And any time anyone asked me to be their mentor, I always accepted that as an honor to help someone, or if there was someone way better than me to mentor them, I made sure they got connected to them. 
So do not be afraid to get mentorship, but don't go to any Tom, Dick, or Harry, right? So make sure that you're assessing the people in your organization that can help you the most. And the second thing I would offer is there's no substitute for good listening. I see so many people in businesses and in government especially, and they really believe that um, it's got to be my way or the highway, and you can hardly get a word in edgewise to, um, to, to talk with them about different perspectives. So if you go into your first position as a good listener seeking a mentor, I think you'll be at least on second base, right? Um, I would say stand up for yourself, be heard, but don't be obnoxious, because um, that won't get you anywhere. Um, and uh, but and follow, you know, like if you really have a dream, follow it. It may take a little zigzaggy path, but you know, just follow it to the best of your ability. Yeah, I have two. So the <clears throat> excuse me, the first one would just be to be confident in myself and know that. I deserve everything that I got, that I worked hard for the various opportunities that I had um, and just have that confidence. I think the second piece is to define what success means to you, whether that's you yourself or you as part of a family or whatever it is. Um, I had a manager once tell me, if they offer you executive of the cleaning crew, you should take it. And that's because to him, becoming an executive was the ultimate success. And to me, it wasn't. Right, And so knowing that everyone you meet, your mentors, your peers, we all have a different definition of success and figure out what success looks like for you and understand that that's going to evolve as you evolve through your career. But let that help drive you as opposed to what other people think you should be doing next or tell you that you should be doing yes next. Really think about what does success look like for you. I would say two, two things, and they kind of go hand in hand or can build off of each other. One is networking. Um, so in addition to your to, to finding mentors, just like Ms. Payton was saying, um, networking up and networking down is kind of important. So one thing that someone told, everyone's heard the whole spiel, it's about who you know, right? Building the, those connections. But then someone once recently told me, it's also about who knows you. And I think I told this to a couple students as well. Building up that network, you're kind of building your brand, building your reputation. Um, even if you're just right out of college, getting into industry, getting into whatever field you want to, to pursue, whatever path or, or career you want, it's important to build up that network in any way that you can and to build your brand, build that reputation, build who you are, but also own who you are and be true to yourself as much as you can too. Because then if you're, if you're true to yourself, then you're really not having to work extra hard at impressing anyone. You're just you're just there. And the other aspect of that that goes hand in hand with networking is the soft skills. So communication, listening, etiquette, um, candor. Um, we we all talk about being super honest, but also about being candid as well. It can can kind of go a long way. It's about how you deliver yourself and information to other people and kind of be your own sales salesperson in a way as best as you can. Um, Y'all had IR last week, right? There was IR last week. Uh, apply online was the name of the game kind of stuff. You're essentially selling yourself, selling you as a product to whoever you were talking to. So you gotta get your elevator speeches going, um, but that's kind of like interview prep. And it also really gears you up for any sort of presentations, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's in front of a top executive, whether it's to a customer, whatever it is. Um, it's those soft skills, but also those listening skills within those soft skills so that you really can understand um, how people are perceiving you and how you can better, better communicate with others as well within your network. So that all kind of goes together. I'm not sure if it's better going first or last. <laughs> <laughs> Or is it better to be the moderator? Right, right, right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> smart women, a bunch of smart women. Um, I think I would tell that 22-year-old me, um, it's going to be a marathon. But don't forget to enjoy the ride. Too much stress to, you know, that we're all, just, the whole room is filled with smart, goal-oriented people. 
and, and sometimes we just get too focused on the end goal. The people I met in college are some of my best friends to this day. So enjoy that. And it was probably the funnest time in my life was college. Awesome, thank you. So I'd like to open it for questions from the audience. I don't know how we did this last time. I know some of the organizers grabbed a microphone and ran around if you have questions. There's at least one already here. Vivian, you want to take my microphone? <laughs> or the one in the back? Or the one in the back? Take it. Share, though. You have to answer the questions, not me, and I won't talk anymore. <laughs> So I'm just curious, um, I know as the older we get, a lot of people say, you know, we're more inclusive with women in the environment, but there's still a lot of discrimination that goes on. So I'm curious how you guys at a young age going into your industry handled that in a professional manner that didn't make you seem snobby or obnoxious. I can take that. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> Catherine and I were talking about this earlier. Um, you know, I think in my career, I've never had someone to my face say like, oh, you're a woman, so you're less than me, right? There hasn't been anything blatant like that, but there have been, you know, microaggressions, small comments that are made or that you overhear um, someone saying. I think for me personally, early in my career, I really struggled with how do you call that out, right? How are, how are you not just like the woman who's always like, oh, you should say they instead of he when you talk about hypothetical engineers, right? Um, so I think... You kind of have to find what works for you. If you have the confidence to call someone out early in your career, do it. If, like me, you don't, at that point in my career, um, I had a great manager who I was able to reach out to a couple times and say, hey, so-and-so made these comments, it made me uncomfortable, and kind of have the conversation that way. I would say now that I'm a leader, no problem. I, I see it as my job to be that person that calls someone out when I hear an inappropriate comment. But it, it can be very tough when you're early in your career. So f find someone that you can go to um, if you're not comfortable in that case. To kind of piggyback off of, of what Jen was saying, yeah, we did have a conversation about this earlier. I have personally experienced a little bit of those little microaggressions, and my confidence has built up over the years on how to handle that. It's just like, yeah, you know, not, not cool. It's okay. But it's kind of that awareness, like you don't know what you don't know. And it might have been fine for one person. They may not have had the confidence to stand up for themselves. And so you kind of have to maybe, okay, this is, this is a learning opportunity for everyone here, right? Everything is a learning opportunity in life is what I would say. Um, I think personally, though, I, I can walk into a board meeting with um, a room filled with men. And it's, it's kind of interesting. I personally like to... I, as a female, I sound different than a man. And so your voice has, will obviously stick out in a crowd when you're in a room filled with men. And I would say you can kind of use it to your advantage. When it, you, once you get that confidence, once you really kind of can own your identity, um, you can kind of use that to, to speak up for someone. I mean, if someone else is, not, is getting talked over, you have that opportunity because you sound different. You can present yourself differently to be like, hey, let, let Jen finish speaking kind of thing. Like that's, that's, that's an advantage that you can kind of play into that I, I know I'm trying to take better ownership of and learning from these opportunities as well to, to be, if I am the only female in the room, to, to help m motivate others as well. I mean, I may not have anything to talk about, but if you're trying to get in, in a word, then let my higher pitch voice <laughs> resonate a little bit differently and get someone else's attention on their behalf, possibly. Um, in my job, in my most of my uh, career, it's like working in a closet. So when I go to work, I work with someone sitting next to me in a closet, and that, and we sit together in this closet for hours on end. <laughs> so. With a really great view, but it is a closet. And there's just this humming sound that goes on for hours and hours and hours. And so you spend some of the time just conversing with each other and getting to know each other. And I would say early on, um, there was, you know, some comments made over the years. And, you know, at first it takes you off your game, you know, and, and it kind of rocks you back on your feet a little bit. But for someone to sort of have the bravery 
to make those comments sitting in a closet next to somebody else. Those were few and far between, I would tell you that. Um, sometimes you could sense those thoughts were there, but they weren't spoken. Um, and I think uh, the, well, the way I dealt with it was more of a sort of an internalized anger that this was actually happening. But then it was almost kind of an inside joke uh, for me and that I was going to show you um, that, you know, your thoughts or your comments uh, were completely baseless. And, um, you know, and now I'm sitting on the left side of the cockpit in my closet and I'm the queen. <laughs> and so nobody says anything anymore. <laughs> well, when I was younger, I worked in a generally a female-dominated field, so we didn't have that. And as I went into wholesale, and I was the only female with 17 guys, most of them I didn't have a problem with. And actually, a few that I did, I just kind of like looked at them and said, um, I'm old enough to be your mother, and you better behave. <laughs> so, um, and that's, and, and the guys that I work with at work, a lot of them are high schoolers or you know, fresh out of college or whatever, so they wouldn't dare, because they look at me and it's like, uh-oh, she's like mom. <laughs> and so they, would n they, they don't say, they, if they're thinking it, they are definitely not saying it, and most of them wouldn't even think that either. So I have a little bit of a unique start in life. I was born with a twin brother, and we just were always treated equal. And I was the only girl in the neighborhood and a tomboy, and I was mean as a rattlesnake. Uh, <laughs> I was probably uh, the aggressor of, uh, of anyone in the neighborhood. And I, uh, I felt, I've always felt very comfortable in rooms with uh, a lot of my peers being, being men. I, uh, you know, I will say that I did have a couple of jobs um, where it was totally women, and oh my gosh, it was so catty. It was, yeah, just deliver me from some of the drama, okay? So I, I just have a little bit different perspective. Uh, and again, why did I mention the mentor? Because that mentor can help you um, figure out how to deal and re-attack something. I'll never forget when I was uh, in uh, the, as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, the Undersecretary of Defense gave us all a personal coach. And because he didn't know us from Adam, he didn't hire us, he had no idea if we knew how to, how to deal with people. And so my coach helped me learn so much about dealing with people. And when I left and went to Air Force, my coach got to go with me uh, because his contract hadn't expired yet. And I do recommend, uh, as you get into positions where you have more leadership, um, that you may want to, to hire a professional coach that uh, will help you through some of those personal behavioral issues that you might be having with, with some of your, the folks that work for you. Um, uh, thanks for the, um, the panel. Um, and one of my question is that, uh, is it common to see like international student uh, work um, who study in the aeronautics or aviation and work in the US industries uh, currently? Because um, I've heard that because international students kind of hard to get um, a job or career in US industries. Uh, in the future, uh, like the aeronautics, like working in Boeing or the GE Aviation? You and me, I guess. Yeah, I think in general, speaking generally, it is more difficult for international students um, to get sponsored by a company in the US in our industry. <coughs> I don't know how much more to offer. That I can't offer. Well, as a that. faculty member, I've observed that it's been <laughs> a little more challenging recently for international students to get jobs in the U.S. Not impossible, but it has yeah. been more challenging. Yeah. There's a question here. Yeah. 
Hi. Um, so in terms of the future of aviation, I know that companies are looking back into commercial supersonic flight. But I know on the other side of that as well as like fuel efficiency and that type of thing. I know that Boeing and Airbus are kind of looking into the hybrid electric field in terms of aircraft. I'm wondering what kind of challenges you guys have to overcome in pursuing that endeavor and whether or not you guys think it will be successful in the near future. So I can take that a little bit. It's, it's not my area of expertise, but I know, you know, when it comes to fuel efficiency, for example, GE's been doing research on that for years, right? We're looking at biofuels. Uh, we're looking at hybrid engines and how do we become more efficient? You know, there was some technology. Um, we have tap, TAPS combustors that reduced our NOx emissions. Um, our LEAP engine had a, I'm going to get this number, I think it was a 10% decrease in fuel burn versus the CFM 56, for example. So I would say from GE's perspective, when it comes to the aircraft engines, it's something that we're working on, it's not new for us. I mean, there's obviously, you know, the climate strike was yesterday. There's a lot of media and attention right now around um, how industry is impacting the climate. And I will say from a GE perspective, it's something we've been working on for years and continue to put money, research dollars into those efforts. I'm afraid I wouldn't yeah. really have a Boeing <laughs> answer to that, um, uh, but I, I do know at least from a, 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 like a generally speaking standpoint, we are we have been looking into it, especially from the fuel efficiency standpoint, because uh, we have we always have some sort of environmental safety briefing going on. So it is it definitely is at the utmost of importance that we are considering that, and they're doing a lot of research into how best to to execute that. I think one of the questions you have to answer is that the energy that you would use to go subsonic yeah. at, at, for only currently over water versus over land, is it, is it really uh, worth that to, for that small amount of time, for that small amount of the population segment um, in terms of the emissions cost? So, and uh, you know, and, and that's from an industrial standpoint and an environmental standpoint. So currently, I think you addressed it earlier, you know, the subsonic is only over the water now. So until you can make it um, more global where you can use that technology, um, I think that's the hurdle, the big hurdle at this point. Yeah, and I, I mean, if you think about it, to go supersonic, right, to go faster, you're going to need more fuel thrown into that engine. So it's definitely at odds with having more fuel-efficient engines, right? So it is, it is kind of this huge system thinking problem to say, you know, we've got regulations that say you can only go supersonic over water. Um, we've got the environmental side of it. You need more fuel to actually go supersonic. So I would say, you know, industry as a whole, we are looking at it. Like you said, hybrid electric is is something that, that is being worked. Um, and I think one thing I've noticed about this industry is like some of these ideas that maybe when I was sitting in your chair more years ago than I want to admit, um, things that seemed like crazy kind of ideas now are actually happening, right? I mean, look at who we had up here talking earlier, right? Um, so if, if you guys can dream it, we'll get there. Yeah, and there is research actually going on at Purdue, looking yeah. at some of these very questions. We're trying to model what would happen if you put supersonics into the fleet and what's the environmental impact. So that is a, a big, important issue. Yeah. I think I'm supposed to try to wrap things up so we can swap the stage. Is that correct? Oh, I still have 10 minutes. Yeah. So then, never mind me. <laughs> that, that's, usually, that's what the students do anyway, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the professor's up there droning. <laughs> Are there more questions for our panelists? Uh, yeah, so obviously aviation and aerospace has uh, representation and diversity issues. What strategies do you think um, would be best implemented to try and address those issues? So I'll speak up. Um, I think it starts at a very young age. So I have a four-year-old daughter, and I will tell you that from the moment I found out I was pregnant, people asked me, do you know if it's a boy or a girl? As if that mattered, right? Um, and I'm telling you from the second she was born, everything is pink and like, right? So I mean, we're very conditioned, right? To say that women do these things. I mean, it's still prevalent, 
right? My four-year-old still gets handed a baby doll and her cousin who's a boy gets handed a dump trunk. So, um, you know, getting, doing outreach programs. Uh, Catherine and I were both involved in Purdue Space Day, it used to be called Fall Space Day when I was here. You know, some of those things to get diverse individuals interested in the STEM fields, I think is how we're gonna get more diversity on campus like Purdue, and then we're gonna see more diversity at GE, right? So it's, I don't, like at GE, we can't solve the problem that there aren't, it's, right, we're not, we're not 50% female in engineering in the US, right? We have to kind of take it back to my four-year-old getting the media messaging that she gets that she can be an engineer and that you know she's worth more than how she looks. So remember I said I work in a closet? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so people don't see me when I'm at work. And that's a problem, um, you know, marketing, um, I, I work in a closet, so you need to see me and you need to see people like me to be inspired that you can be me. So that's part of the problem. Um, but I, 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 I applaud um, the major carriers, certainly in this country now, who are actively pursuing us and actively recruiting us. They want us there. They found out that we're good employees, we're good pilots. Um, and so they, you know, to their credit, are after us, and that helps. So outreach. I think to, to that point, I would probably say getting rid of assumptions on people, just in general. Mm -hmm. you, you, just, you can never judge a book by its cover kind of deal. Just getting rid of assumptions that if, if that's a little girl over there, she likes princesses or something like that. It's just kind of getting rid of that. My niece, both of my nieces actually, I give them pink slippers that are in the shape of airplanes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a win-win in my book. Right. I'm like, hey, it's a great color, and they're plush and cute. It's great. <laughs> so I think it's just getting rid of assumptions. And, and I know that sometimes I'll walk into um, a meeting at times, and I'm not immediately seen as an engineer. They just they, they assume that I'm from finance or contracts or something like that. Then you can whip out some technical stuff, and it's like, whoa, she, she's legit, OK? <laughs> um, so it's just getting, kind of getting rid of that assumptions, and it's just that overall awareness. And uh, I think you just generally getting rid of any sort of assumption about a person before you really can get to know them, that's, that's going to benefit the world, really. <laughs> just be kind. <laughs> <laughs> Group hug. There's a question over here, it looks like, Vivian. So if you guys were to pick like a situation that made your career like something that you guys decided, okay, this could have been something that I would change, not necessarily like something that I did wrong that, I, that if I did it in a different way, like looking back five, 10 years or maybe less, or, like, some point that said, okay, this path was a wrong path. Like how did you realize that like, oh, I should have taken another turn on that situation. Would it change anything? Um, when you get up, and like somebody said this morning that they cried on their way to work, or they cried on their way home, <laughs> when you get up and you go, oh God, I gotta go to work, that is when you really know that you shouldn't be there anymore. When you look at people and you just, or, or your engine, um, and you just go, I just, <laughs> I, I, I don't like this. That's when you've, you've been in it too long. Um, you know, that was how I was um, after 10 years in retail. I didn't ever want to do it again, and I still don't want to do it. I don't care how much they pay me. <laughs> I, I, this is a really personal story, but I think it goes to trusting your intuition and one of the biggest regrets I have from the years in the Pentagon was that I did not come out with my guns blazing when my principal deputy was uh, annihilated in the front page of the Washington Post for um, some type of what the Post reporter thought was improper uh, funding of his job. And... Um, you know, 
it takes a long time to get hired in the Pentagon. And so we really needed the expertise of this combat war veteran who was a techno geek who um, understood all the nuances of acquisition and the federal acquisition regulations. That is a unicorn, okay? That is a guy you really want on your team. So the Secretary of the Air Force had him hired under a contract, um, and it was totally above board, and he was doing special work uh, until his, the personnel group could get him hired. And when that, uh, he did an interview because someone had brought it to the, to the, uh, the Washington Post as an issue, and um, he was devastated. And instead of uh, protecting him, uh, coming out verbally and supporting him, I was told by uh, the comm people that, oh, this, this story has no balance, it's not going anywhere. And uh, about uh, three weeks later, I get a call that he'd committed suicide. Uh, and I lost a, a dear friend and a, and a wonderful uh, contributor to our Air Force. And I, I think we need to really know when to act and when to take the advice of others that may have different motives. And so I think that's probably my greatest regret, regret that um, you know, I wasn't a better wingman uh, for my principal deputy. Yeah. Maybe one more question if there's time. Yeah. I guess this is more of like a lighthearted question. What are your favorite aircrafts? Because I know there are like pilots on there. So what are your favorite aircrafts to fly or just look at, I guess? Ready. Ready for this Margie wants to go first this time. <laughs> Margie's ready. It's whatever plane you're flying. <laughs> I checked out as a captain uh, in 1996. That was my first captainship and that was in a 727. So that'll always have a special place in my heart. But truly, if you ask a pilot what their favorite aircraft it is, Donna Baring in the back there, it's always the airplane that you're currently flying. I agree with that, but yes. My personal favorite happens to be a Cessna 177, and that's what I have the most hours in, so that's kind of why I, I like that one better than most of the rest of them. But I've also flown 150s, 172s, 182s, and Pipers. Um, mine's the SR-71. Oh. It's just a sexy plane. I mean, come on. Wow. And I, and I, that's blasphemous for me to say because it's not GE engines, but <laughs> don't tell anyone, okay? That's my favorite plane. Um, the Wright Pat Air Force Museum, if you have not been there, it is amazing. It's about, what, three hours from here in Dayton, Ohio, so it's only about an hour for me from Cincinnati. It's free, Go there if you have not been because they have some amazing plans, planes you can get geeked out about whatever your favorite plane is. They probably have it. And expect to spend multiple days. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anna, did you ask that question? Is your name? Your name's Shirley. Okay. Shirley, I've got to tell you, without a doubt, it's the A-10 Warthog. Mm. Yeah. And I, and I will tell you why. Of course, cool. I've never flown it. <laughs> Thank God I've never been shot by a pilot who was strafing, uh, strafing the ground. But I had lots of occasions to go to Walter Reed uh, when I worked at the Pentagon. And I'll never forget going into um, this one uh, Army sergeant's room, and he had been really, really injured uh, in Afghanistan. And of course, the Air Force didn't have as many injuries. Um, because we were above the fray uh, a lot and, uh, and flying. So I went in there and I said, you know, if there's anything I can do, uh, and he looks at me like, what in the world could you do? But he said, you know, there is something. You're from the Air Force. Do, do you have enough clout to bring an A-10 pilot in to talk to me? And I said, I'll bring you, I'll bring you a whole squadron of A-10 <laughs> pilots in to talk to you. And the reason he wanted to talk to an A-10 pilot is because he had been caught in a crossfire, and literally that A-10 pilot came in and schwacked the bad guys and saved his life, and, you know, uh, 
so we did. We arranged for A-10 pilots to go in and visit with him. And, I, and it's because of the mission. And, uh, you know, I hate it that they think the F-35 can take that mission over because I just, I just don't get it. But, um, yeah, we gotta, we got to keep our A-10s flying and keep them upgraded. And to me, that's the, that's the greatest uh, DOD weapon system we have. I, I have one. It's hard to go after Stu, so I'll go one if you want to think. Just well, I, I got to got some, but I think I'm a little bit torn, being that they're not a Boeing, maybe. And so I was like, oh, God. And you, and you work on the F-18, maybe? Um, I know. Friends. So I, I do work on F-18, so I do love me some F-18s, man. I mean, yeah. oh, yeah. They just they just get your, your heart going. It's 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 a pretty sexy jet. Um, then you got... Uh, I did work on the F-22 program, so that kind of, it was, it was like the, my, the F-22 pro program was, is a joint collaboration between Lockheed Martin and Boeing, um, and that, it was like my first real career platform I got to serve on, so that always will have a, a soft spot. It's also a super sexy jet, too. Um, I think just a P-51 Mustang, Aww. though. Do you hate me? I love it. Okay. I was just like, oh, God, I'm what are sorry. they doing? I've never been around this many women who <laughs> think airplanes are so sexy. Um, I just got to say, if you haven't been to Oshkosh, Wisconsin for their adventure, yeah, I'm going to okay. There, oh, gosh. If you camp out, you hear those Mustangs roaring up at 6 in the morning. Normally, you wouldn't want to be woken up at 6 in the morning, but with that sound, it's really okay. Very cool. That's, oh, it's so cool. I'm still trying to get a ride on a Lockheed Constellation. Oh. I think there's two or three left flying. I had a shot at like, it was like $800 for 30 minutes when I was an undergrad and I couldn't afford it. But the, the Lockheed Connie is just a beautiful plane to look at. Yeah. That's mine. Hey, I think we're out of time. Please thank, join me in thanking our panelists, Sue, Margaret, Jen, Catherine, and Margie. Thank you for the questions. We're going to start the next session as soon as we turn the stage over, I think, right? The next session will start as soon as we turn the stage over, right? So hang around. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>